When I heard Out of the Blue for the first time, I just, I just thought it was a hit. <laughs> What's this? This is awesome, but I'm scared as hell because I don't know what to do with it. At least a track which was going to change the, the, the trance world. I remember that I was listening to the very first setup of Out of the Blue. And I was on a holiday. Uh, I was in Venice. Uh, and uh, Ferry called me. And he's like, hey, this is a tune. As an A&R, you don't have that feeling all the time, so that's, that's the best feeling there is. When I heard Out of the Blue for the first time, I just, I just thought it was a hit. <laughs> I mean, that was the business I was in. I was, I was, you know, I was obviously DJing in clubs, DJing on the radio, you know, running my own label, FFRR. It, it very rapidly became one of the biggest tracks for all of, all of the principal DJs that were playing that style. Out of the Blue was influenced by, uh, by, by music that was more from the 80s. Uh, I would definitely say um, Italo, Italo Dance. That was sort of like the, the stuff that influenced me to make that track. Um, obviously, the, the Out of the Blue came out, came out much later than, than the Italo era. Yeah, I really wanted to, uh, to, to, uh, to build a track that was telling a story in a way, you know. You would feel from the start that what, what you were hearing at that point wasn't really everything yet. It was like a unique trend sound back then. Trends a paar jaar geleden was toch een hele monotone, uh, ja, duister uh, muziek. En uh, nu is het allemaal echt mijn, wat nu heel erg eruit springt uit, uh, uit die sound, is gewoon de, uh, ja, de melodie. Het is echt gebaseerd op melodieën, waardoor het dus ook weer op een of andere manier heel, heel poppy wordt. I mean, trance music at its essence is pretty simple. Always got that kind of slightly um, melancholic melodrama attached to them as well. A kind of DNA link back to classical melodies. So I think um, Ferry managed to get all those things working on that track. Yeah, I, I was still living with my parents. You know, my bedroom was the attic. <laughs> so I had my studio in, in my bedroom. And uh, I, I definitely remember that I, uh, when I produced it, I even remember finding the melody and my sort of, how can I say, my euphoria with it. Like, <gasps> what's this? This is awesome, but I'm scared as hell because I don't know what to do with it, you know? That, that, that's what I felt because it was, like I said, it was so different. The reason why it's called Out of the Blue is that it, that's how I felt. It came out of the blue because I, I wasn't really looking too long for the melody, it just happened. At that time I wasn't producing anything under my own name yet. I just was doing different uh, pseudonyms. And uh, System F was, basically comes from the way I was producing music, very systematic, you know. Everything was just like according to a certain, you know, schedule almost. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, with Tsunami Records, Michael was uh, was working with uh, with us at the time. We felt like, okay, this needs a bit of a different approach to have more impact even. So we decided to just go with uh, almost like a guerrilla style marketing. I invited him to come down to the office, uh, to the company I was working back then. Um, and I told him like, okay, this is normally not the work you should do as an artist, but what we are going to do is we are going to um, uh, delete the number in the white label in, on, on the vinyl, we are going to delete it so nobody is able to trace it. Because through the serial number on the vinyl you could do often, often trace back what the label would be. And we are just, just going to send it out as, as out of the blue, that's it. And uh, so both, both of us were sitting on the ground 
and, and, and making those, creating those white labels to send out. Uh, we had like these, uh, these black sleeves um, that we just stepped on and you know, sort of scratched along the wall, so they looked all banged up and whatever. I felt so strongly that it was going to be a huge hit or at least a track which was going to change the, the, the trans world. I was always listening to Pete Tong, so, and he was like probably one of the first to play the record on radio together with Judge Jules. Um, and, and, and so that was a lot of fun as well, that to, to, to listen to BBC Radio 1, hearing the track there being played uh, during all the, the specialized programs. And later on it was being an official ad on, uh, on Radio 1 as well. A, a track like that was well, because if you can imagine that a Pete Tong was just dying to sign a record and, and played it over and over, which is a 140 BPM trance track, Imagine Piton playing that nowadays. It's like, okay, so it was a, it was a very different track. There was two dominant things in the 90s, was, was you know, Britpop and the rise of club culture and the music that was coming out of the UK club scene and, in, in, and, the, and the fact that, you know, the whole of Europe was leaning into um, creating music that was played, played in UK clubs. We were at the peak of a, of a dance explosion, you know, um, so dance music, was very dominant on the, on the Radio 1 playlist and Ferry had one of the hottest records of the year, so it, it deserved to be there. Well, those days, I, um, I wasn't really DJing yet, honestly. When Out of the Blue came out, um, Ministry of Sound, after like a few months actually, because of the hype around Out of the Blue, called me uh, to ask me if I was interested in doing uh, Translation, the series. So the first five editions of Ministry of Sound Translation. Uh, and because of that, I got my first, basically my first real bookings. My, pretty much my first market wasn't even Holland, it was, uh, it was England. So yeah, there, that's where the, the main success of Out of the Blue started. And then the next one after that was Japan. And obviously the track was everywhere. Yeah, Out of the Blue was for me definitely the, uh, the, the, the make track, you know, that, that Put me on a lot of people's radar. I, I listen to it now, and I just think I just think it's um, you know like like a lot of like great music. It's actually incredibly simple, <laughs> and it really came down to you know some very simple things. You know, great great melody, great arrangement, great rhythm, um, and that's why it stands the test of time. I, th I think there was a point probably you know in the 10 years after it came out where it was like, I don't want to hear it anymore because <laughs> it, was, it was so popular. But now looking back in hindsight, I'm proud that I was able to sign it. I'm very proud that it was part of like the FFRR legacy and history. And I'm so proud of it, in fact, that we're actually looking at, I'm looking at doing um, an adaptation of it now for my Ibiza Classics show, so which is really exciting. Will I be constantly bringing back these old projects or just yeah, no. At some point, said, "Okay, it's enough, and, and, and let it be." But you know, there's always. Look, I'm I'm, I'm a pretty sort of free-flowing producer in the studio. I make what I feel at this moment. So if I, at some point, produce a track that I feel like, yeah, this cannot be anything else but System F, perhaps, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't say I no. It's not a hard no, but we'll see.